Good afternoon. This is Russell Liu, one of your co-hosts for Think Tech Asia, and I'm along here uh, with along here today is Ray Tsuchiyama, my co-host. Ray, say hello, Ray. Thank you very much. Hello. And we're here today to explore some of the global issues that impact Hawaii, uh, particularly issues uh, of what's happening in Asia. Today on our show, we're going to talk about uh, the One Belt One Road uh, initiative that many people are hearing, uh, and which has been actually undergone. Uh, through many changes through the past couple of years uh, and how it does affect Hawaii and U.S. And we're going to talk about some other issues that affect uh, Hawaii. Uh, for example, the uh, proposed hotel room tax increase and how does it affect our Asia travelers, especially those coming from Japan and from our new markets from China. And so today um, we're going to first talk about the One Belt, One Road initiative and One Belt, One Road initiative, as proposed by China, it's actually a proposal that has been ongoing for the past few years, uh, which proposes a major uh, shift in a paradigm in a business model. And it proposes to involve many countries, a lot of money, and building infrastructure through the old China Silk Road uh, that brought trade from China through the Middle East, Africa, and Europe. And um, we're also going to talk about the uh, other Silk Road, which is the New Silk Road, which is the Maritime Silk Road. So, Ray, um, you, you know, you're a great historian. <laughs> you know, why don't you give us a little background of your knowledge, as you were discussing earlier, about the Silk Road? Well, you know, you go back when um, a Italian man named Marco Polo came back from China talking about uh, a society that had grand canals and they used paper money. They had uh, all kinds of uh, a, uh, security throughout the, uh, the land. And there was an emperor called Kublai Khan at that point. And he traveled to uh, China from, uh, from Genoa and, and, or Venice at that point, Italy, the city states that were major center of the trade. And they went through uh, what we now will see as uh, you know, uh, Turkey, uh, through um, uh, the Middle East, uh, Kazakhstan, through the old cities, Samarkand, Tashkent, you know, all these areas that were beautiful, gleaming uh, cities with uh, you know, hundreds of camels coming uh, through with silks and, and uh, jewels and all kinds of tea and incense, all kinds of products from China going to Europe and uh, things uh, coming from Europe uh, to, um, uh, to China. So they had a long overland route that took many, many months to get to, and they landed in a, a unbelievable civilization of that time uh, on, uh, under the uh, emperor of China. Yes, yeah, fantastic story. You know, when I'm in the museums in China, Ray, I actually see figurines from that period. It was the height of the Tang Dynasty, and you would actually see figurines that would have people with big nose, <laughs> light colored hair, and also the African culture. You could right. see all these figurines. So you know that the Silk Road has been uh, a economic route, uh, and people from many cultures uh, have been involved. So again, the Silk Road is something that China is, is it's an initiative. And it, it is a very big and bold and vicious plan because it's going to really um, boost the, and build infrastructure and trade along uh, the corridor from through China, through Kazakhstan, to right. the Middle East, and then through Europe. And in fact, Ray, a few uh, months ago, there was a first train that came right. from, actually started in near Yiwu, China, went all the way to London for right. two weeks, and it went through all these different countries. So we're seeing as part of the uh, dry run, the Silk Road that's being recreated. And imagine if you're on this train uh, from China and uh, traveling all the way to London and all the cities you pass through, uh, like you said, Kazakhstan and, and through Turkey, through um, uh, the former Yugoslav republics, going up to Vienna and, and then to Paris and London. And you could get off and then uh, you could talk to other traders in those cities. There's a lot of interaction that uh, takes place. You can just have uh, you know all kinds of uh, interaction through this uh, train system that really wasn't there until just recently, you know, high speed uh, freighter, freight carrying and passenger carrying trains. And these are really uh, an area where China is putting a lot of research and design efforts. You know, one thing that strikes me also is that we're having a lot of discussion these days about uh, China's presence in the South China Seas. And, and, and for people who are not up to speed and, and being in Beijing, I'm there a lot of times there, actually have a home there. 
Um, I, you know, the, the concern really is more economic focus, that they're looking to making sure the international shipping lanes are open. And, and that's part going to be part of the, the maritime road, uh, which will start in southern China and will go on down to Southeast Asia. This is the old route uh, that go, went to, it goes to Africa, Suez Canal, Mediterranean Ocean, and to Italy and up through Europe. So, so there's a historical basis. I know, Ray, you're the historian buff, and, and you may recall. Well, and, and uh, it was the last great uh, you know, adventure, <laughs> a naval um, you know, uh, fleet that China organized, uh, like you say, went down uh, to the Malacca Straits and then uh, uh, westward uh, towards uh, India through uh, Ceylon and managed to get to the eastern uh, uh, coastline of Africa and what we, is near uh, now, Tanganyika and Kenya, and they still uncover uh, pottery uh, from the Chinese ships that uh, mm -hmm. came by. So it, it, it occurred uh, during the Ming Dynasty, the, uh, at last, and then they came back, and then they never went out again, uh, China. It, it, and there was isolation with China. But you're correct that China does have a, a great maritime tradition going outside, and they went all the way to uh, the east coast of Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're interesting because many Western critics are saying it's going to be a bust. And being in China for now 14 years, whenever the government sets their mind on something, it happens. So I'm pretty confident it's going to be happen. Um, but what, what are your thoughts on, on this new Silk Road coming? Do you think that there are opportunities for Americans? Well, I think so. I think um, that uh, there are a lot of, um, well, first of all, <laughs> though, as you know, the American uh, tradition of trains is not that stellar. <laughs> uh, that um, you know, Amtrak and so forth really hasn't, uh, we didn't really develop a high-speed train network until very recently. We're just exploring at this point. You know, why is there a train system from a high speed from San Francisco to Los Angeles or San Francisco to uh, Vegas or to Seattle? for example. And so you have a lot of uh, uh, freight trains still, but they're very slow and not really uh, good networks. I, I think for the United States, for Americans, uh, looking at, um, uh, at this initiative, I think it's something that uh, unless we become part of it, we may become excluded from it. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at uh, all the stops that the trains are making toward, uh, uh, that are going eastward from uh, China to London, uh, these, these will be uh, soon populated by Chinese traders. Mm -hmm. They're going to be in those little cities all along the uh, way. And they may be catalysts for economic development mm -hmm. in those areas for industry. And also uh, for uh, opening uh, new markets, as you know, the rising middle class wants a lot of things, mm -hmm. all kinds of uh, good designer uh, retail, uh, things to uh, adorn their homes. Uh, they're finally going out and um, driving around in China, and this did not occur until very recently. There's a whole network of freeways. Also, this is a tourism boom when you think about it. Uh, for the uh, maritime uh, areas, uh, now that's, that's a more complex question because the old uh, British and American, um, uh, you know, looking at the sea is for coaling stations, refueling stations. Singapore was very, very important. Mm -hmm. uh, many uh, important uh, bases. Pearl Harbor is very important for the St Spanish-American War. Going out to the Philippines, they had to have a, a station to re uh, uh, refuel uh, ships and so forth. But again, uh, the, the uh, seaports along the way to Africa and then going to the Suez Canal and so forth may experience a boom also. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, unless uh, American um, uh, companies, uh, entrepreneurs really look at this and really become part of it, they may be left behind. Yeah. And it's very interesting that, 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 that what your comments are here because I feel the same way. Uh, if we don't get involved, we're going to be left out. And one of the things that's very different than the American model, the American model was the uh, T, uh, is it, uh, TPP, right. Trans-Pacific Partnership, which, which was an agreement, an agreement that bound nations um, that were allies to the U.S. Um, and excluded China, of course. Um, and it was f focusing on the Pacific Asia region area. And uh, the so difference... High growth. That high, growth yes. High growth countries. And the difference is that the um, One Belt, One Road is not based on agreement. It's an initiative. And rather, it's a network based on infrastructure development trade. Uh, and it's not any kind of agreement that's passed around because there are 60 nations involved, 60% of the world's population is involved on the, under the, uh, on the One Belt, One Road versus 800 million uh, that people that were involved in the TI, uh, TPP. 
Um, it's very interesting because we're having a, uh, uh, a, a lot of thought about it because President Trump, hit the policy for the Americans is we stay out of it. Right. Which means, again, that we don't join it, we may be excluded from this thing that's going to really happen, and it's going to be over a 50-year period. To me, also, trade is not only about agreements, it's about people, and people becoming experts in markets, in products, and so forth. And what has been one of the great um, uh, stories that haven't, hasn't been told completely is about Chinese traders going to areas that didn't really have trade or industry like Africa. They're everywhere. <laughs> They're in uh, South Africa. There's a Chinatown there. Uh, a lot of places in, in East Africa, West Africa. There's a lot of people from China now living and, and really uh, doing trade and uh, manufacturing in those countries. So uh, that's an, uh, a story that really uh, has not been told. Well, I think you have a good point before we go to a break. And it's a culture. And if we look at the history of the Chinese migration uh, based on economic opportunities, um, they went around the world. They settled, they localized, right. rather than a regime change or political change. So this one belt, one road, the Chinese are stressing, it's not here to impose any political will. It's not, uh, we're going to do something because we want you to change and become a communist country. None of that's there. And it's interesting because the question after the break will be, how can Hawaii benefit? And let me give you some thought, Ray. Let's give our audience some thought. One of the things that I've noticed is that the uh, new One Belt, One Road initiative is going to open a lot of opportunity in the service area. Accountants, logistics, insurance, right, yeah. massive opportunity. Yeah. Um, that's a key thing we're going to talk about after the break. Second thing is that um, it not only is that interesting, is that China is starting to develop relationships, trade agreements in Central uh, and um, uh, South America. A lot of the countries, Peru, Peru Brazil, right. uh, all of these countries. And you know, remember why America stopped at Honolulu, Hawaii? It was a sh shipping, refueling, right. restocking. Now think about it. If South America, Central America brings back things to China, that's a big ocean. They're going to have to stop somewhere. The Pacific Ocean is a wide area. Honolulu can be a very important place. But we need to think about it. Right. We need to strategize. And we need to think not politics, but business, okay. international, right. global business. And I think it's going to be a very important thing that we should not overlook because we've become sort of like the middle guy, the broker, you know, and it brings stability to Asia. So we play an important role for the America because it'll bring stability to trade and being a stopping point here. So how do we change our laws? How do we keep with this in mind? How do we attract investment for Chinese to start coming in to our community, help us build ports? public-private partnerships with all this anticipation because as Central and South America trade and China grows. In fact, one of the BRICS member, China's a member, is Brazil. Right, right and, exactly. Yeah. And so they are lending money. The BRICS is lending $50 billion, I believe, to this project. So part of that one about one road is not going to just be the maritime route that goes from China to Southeast Asia, Africa, and Europe, and overlap from China to Europe, but it's also going to be Pacific back to the U.S. I think we're neglecting that, and so we're going to have okay. a break shortly. But that's what we need to to, to focus on after the break. Okay. Um. Hi, and thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Justine Spiritu, and I host the Hawaii Food and Farmer series with my co-host Matthew Johnson of Oahu Fresh. Every week we bring on farmers as well as all the other individuals and organizations that help support a thriving sustainable food system. In fact, it's interesting to learn what others are doing so you don't have to be a Hawaii resident or producing food on Hawaii to be featured on the show. Like today's guest, Wyatt Bryson of Jewels of the Forest and Microlab Solutions. Aloha, thank you. It's been a pleasure being on the show. Um, I love uh, seeing what you guys do and I really support your mission. And uh, it's really nice being back in Hawaii. And uh, thank you again, it's an honor. So you can see guests like Wyatt every Thursday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Russell Liu, along with my co-host, Ray Tsuchiyama. We're Think Tech Asia. And today we're talking about the One Belt, One Road initiative proposed by China. And more specifically, we're going to talk in this part of the show about how does it relate to Hawaii and what are the opportunities to Hawaii. As, as we just before the break mentioned, 
Ray, you were about to say well, something. Well, uh, I've been thinking about what you just said, and there are great opportunities. Um, what has happened, though, was that, uh, like the refueling analogy you just made with ships, there was um, a her, um, uh, planes coming here from um, Japan or Asia and from the, uh, from the mainland, and, and refueling here up till the 80s. Remember, they had to stop someplace, or Alaska and so forth, the 707s. And then came 747s, and they didn't have to refuel anymore, and they went overflight. And, 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 and a kind of overflight also occurs in container ships. For example, when I moved back to Hawaii, it was cheaper for me to send my household items in a container to LA or Long Beach because it, it, to Honolulu, they had to make a stop in Long Beach and come back again. You see what I mean? Because everything was going to the great markets, cars, electronics, all kinds of finished goods, uh, to uh, the mainland markets. Nothing was coming here uh, over ships. And there has to be a reason why ships come here, a reason why they have to be refinished or uh, for design centers or uh, fabrication, something for them, to, for planes and, and ships uh, to come here. So I think uh, that's a great uh, uh, point that you have. How can Hawaii, because of a mid-Pacific uh, location, take advantage of the trade going back and forth and becoming a middleman, a broker, and so forth, just like Singapore uh, does it for the globe? And uh, think about it. They have an airline that, you know, Singapore Airlines, that's global. They go to London, they go to the uh, Middle East, they go to uh, uh, South America, and all over the globe. Uh, think of the uh, flights that uh, you want to go to Asian capitals for Honolulu, and you can't. Mm -hmm. It's really a challenge. You have to go through a hub like Incheon or Tokyo or whatever, uh, Hong Kong. So uh, it, it's really tough. Yes. And, and again, uh, how do you uh, uh, leverage that? And of course, uh, uh, building up our port infrastructure. Is it state of the art? Mm -hmm. it, it can it unload and, and uh, uh, you know, and put back on ships uh, when you finish products um, for uh, markets in Asia very quickly or vice versa. So you come up with, and, and again, you talk about people who can uh, speak other languages, can uh, have business and, and finance, and a lot of expertise in markets who are like um, people who can uh, deal with logistics, like you say. Mm -hmm. you know, how, how, uh, this whole flow supply chain, you know, which is a major area of, of uh, research and, and study even today for semiconductors, for electronics, for cars, it's a, it's a huge yeah. uh, area. Uh, we're not in that. We don't, the last uh, 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 place that had manufacturing here was Dole Pineapple. Yes. <laughs> yes. When it shut down, there was an end of manufacturing uh, yes. here. So we have to get back into uh, developing a base or expertise in that area. Yes, it, and it's very interesting because Donald Trump says our president says make America great again. Yes. <laughs> and I, I think, I think right. we have to use the term here. Uh, remake Hawaii again. We need to reinvent <laughs> ourselves. And, and getting back right. to that, Ray, right. it's a very important point is that today's world, you know, we don't need heavy manufacturing. But what we need to do is send a clear signal that, that we have the ability to do things here uh, to provide value to the supply chain. For example, you were in the software industry, and, you know, we talk about software development here, but, you know, we have to build capacity. We have to get back in our university, bring all these Chinese students who would not get an MIT, but are smart enough, they can come to UH and are engineer and are high tech, work alongside, study with our own local kids who then become more global and they bring relationships. And, uh, you know, we can slowly build on that. Uh, but again, you know, this one belt, one road means that trades also is through this Pacific corridor. Ships should stop here. Um, you know, there's federal legislation which prevents the ship from stopping here. They, they have to go to Long Beach, unload, come back here. But maybe we need to revisit this. We need, you know, our legislative group to take action. But we need to come to master plan, and this one belt, one road can mean a lot because, as you coined the term, we can really be an important middleman, a broker, yeah. because the ships will have to stop here. They have to, if they, especially if they're going to new markets in South America, Central America. And I know the Chinese are slowly going to South and Central America. They're starting to invest in not only the infrastructure, not only getting supplies in South America, but actually they're looking to building Chinese manufacturing uh, uh, centers in, in Central and South America. So the, the global paradigm shift means that we have to figure where our value is going to be. Well, you're absolutely correct. I mean, uh, South America uh, has uh, gone through you know, ups and downs. Uh, 
uh, one economist uh, used to uh, say, it's a, it's a half joke, that Brazil is the country of the future and always will be. <laughs> or look at Venezuela, that's having uh, uh, extreme difficulties. And um, it, it, they do have a market, they do have very talented people, but South America uh, you know, really uh, needs a kind of a focus on uh, how they transform a very rich region, when you think about mm -hmm. it, in terms of uh, not only, you know, uh, uh, material uh, uh, capacity in minerals and, uh, and, and timber and so forth, uh, but also a human capital. They have great universities in Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, and so forth. And, and, and Brazil, Peru, and as you know, uh, many places, uh, countries look like the United States. They have a wide range of immigrants and entrepreneurs. Uh, how do you uh, link that up? Uh, well, it's like Africa also. I think you're correct that uh, where uh, Chinese traders go, and then uh, one of the most interesting things is uh, they also give scholarships for African or South American students to study back in Beijing, or and then learn Mandarin and come back, and they become like liaisons, you know, mm -hmm. uh, between uh, Chinese uh, companies and their host countries, and that's something that uh, is really part of a really uh, a dynamic plan, mm -hmm. and something that I, I don't think we understand in the U.S. that they're building a people-to-people -people base. Yes, yes. And that's important because the people to people, as you know, Ray, I, I'm also, uh, I teach law at, at Beijing Foreign Studies University, where 93 languages are spoken. Wow. And 10% of the student population are international. They yep. come from Europe, they come from Africa, uh, Japan, other places in Asia. But, but we're seeing that, that there is a global shift in paradigm and change thinking. And only until this year, I've got two Hawaii friends, parents who are actually sending their kids out there to learn language and study international business in Beijing. So as you pointed out, we need the people to people exchange. And, and if there's a call to action, I, I would think the first is on my list is A, we need to get language capability here. Um, I was talking to a very famous physician here who is from here many years, uh, from Schraub, and he retired and he actually is on the academic side now. He goes in Wisconsin. And the number of Chinese students are amazing that are going oh, right, to these yeah, schools. Right. Uh, and they're starting to go out. You know, we need to actively push. Uh, we need to work together as a community uh, to do people-people relationship. We cannot be afraid because when you think of language Mandarin, it's not going to be a Mandarin so ethnic cultural. It's a language of business. In China, I'm in meetings. Many times I'm with meetings with a Korean, an African, right. and a Russian. And I'm sitting there, and not all of them speak English. Right. So we speak in Mandarin. It's becoming a language <laughs> wow, of business. Yeah, so right. there's a paradigm shift. But so again, language capability. We need to have our students and kids here embrace it to learn the language. We need to have that because business can't stop here if you don't have language. And it's sort of like the, the Japanese investments here in the 80s and 90s, where we have a great language capability, many Japanese speaking. Oh, yeah, and, and right. We don't have it here, but we need to do that. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well, well uh, Japanese uh, uh, still is the number one foreign language in many, many uh, schools. And, um, uh, but it's a kind of an interesting um, reason for that. And my sister teaches Japanese at Farrington High School. Uh, but many of the students are uh, children of families that work in Waikiki. And if you know Japanese, you can get ahead because you know uh, still there's 1.8, 1.9 million Japanese visitors uh, come to Hawaii annually. So that that's an added kind of uh, skill that you have. Uh, but I think we, uh, the state, has to look at the future uh, and and uh, really uh, create a uh, cadre uh, of uh, uh, of uh, Mandarin speaking, uh, not only. Um, uh, people in the hospitality industry, but in business, in mm. technology, many uh, service industries, and so forth. Uh, what happened during the 80s when the Japanese came uh, as a wave was that there were enough people who spoke Japanese. Uh, my mother was one, for example, uh, who was raised, uh, came from Japan, and others just enough, and the Japanese-speaking lawyers, that kind of met the demand. And, but it was not planned. It, was just, it just happened by chance. And here we have an opportunity where we can design our future uh, uh, better than other states of the union. However, other states, as you know, uh, Fairfax County, and Minnetonka, and Minnesota are doing immersion programs mm -hmm. in Chinese from kindergarten all, you know, up. They're doing a lot of things dealing with, uh, with exchanges, and they're ahead of us. 
uh, Vegas and San Francisco and Seattle and so forth. They're ahead of us and also trying to attract uh, wealthy Chinese to uh, do medical tourism yes. also. Mm -hmm. That's part of that. Uh, so there's a whole um, uh, kind of uh, not one thing but mm -hmm. multiple ways of, of kind of attracting people uh, to do business. And then when they therefore a stay at the Mayo Clinic or in Seattle uh, or San Francisco, then they look for a place to stay. Maybe they mm -hmm. buy something. They, they, they have their children attend college there. There's a whole kind of acceleration of interaction. So I think that's getting back, we've got just a few minutes to yep. go here. I think what we're both saying is that we need to get the language capability quickly. We need to bring in Chinese students here at TUH who are in the technical field, who will uh, bring us uh, a platform for our local kids to be more global. And, and I think it's important that, that we look at the tourism. Now, well, there's a local issue recently, the tourism tax, a proposed That's right, right. we're coming to that, yes, and, the TAT, and, the tran and, yeah, transit accommodation tax, and to 12.5 12.5, yeah. And so that's going to affect tourism. And, you know, a new market for the Chinese, they have many options uh, because they're so Internet savvy. They're FIT travelers. Many of them will choose other destinations. But they never had a, um, uh, a hearing to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, for the people, experts in the industry, to tell them what the Chinese tourists are thinking about. Yes, and that's, that's very important. And, and what strikes me as important is that I think people, there's taxes and taxes we're building, but what it goes on to vision is we need to do something to bring business. We need to bring business. Tourism is not going to last forever because of the Internet and because of air travel that can bypass this place. We have to make a reason for people to come here, especially the Chinese who will see the place like the place, want to buy a house, invest, uh, bring the... Uh, uh, the professionals here, the lawyers, have, let them open bank accounts or local banks so there's a connection, a relationship begins. But always becomes that we need to look at a larger long-term vision. So do you have thoughts to add to that, Ray, before we close our show today? Well, you're absolutely right. I, I think uh, it, this kind of uh, tax uh, that pays for rail um, is, is not a great argument <laughs> to, uh, to present to Chinese tourists who have uh, who have funds to go to the uh, Maldives or you know Vietnam or uh, Korea or San Francisco or, or Vegas. So I, I think we really have to think, uh, what is our brand? What, what is our strategy? How can we really make this not only for tourists, but but uh, two steps ahead, and mm -hmm. you're correct, that uh, could be a center for, uh, uh, to develop the economy of Hawaii uh, with, uh, with an access to the market in China. Yes, and I, and I agree with Ray, and we're going to shortly end our show, but I, again, we hope that our viewers out there would, would digest some of these issues. These are very important. One, globe, one road, uh, is, is a one belt is going to be a very important, and you need to figure a way how we're going to get, Hawaii's going to get in there. That ties in with tourism also. And it's very important that we think global and we really start acting on as a community together, working as a community, because the opportunities with the Chinese are going to be less and less because they're going to invest elsewhere. It's like a pie of money. There's so much money. And I think we need to, as a community, figure out how we're going to be a middleman here and how we can attract investments here to help join that One Belt, One Road initiative. And so, Ray, um, I have no further thoughts. And you have any further thoughts to tell no, our audience I, except... I, 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 I think we're, uh, we just have to be very close to what's happening because this, is, this may change history in a huge way. Yes, and it's going to change history, and we're going to have to be on top of it. We're going to have to be ahead of it, in fact, because the planes will file over us. The Internet will also, uh, uh, the Chinese will not come here. And so, again, to our audience, again, this is Ray Tsuchiyama and Russell Liu from ThinkTech uh, Global, ThinkTech Asia, and we're live in our Honolulu studios. And uh, our next series, we are going to, part of it, we will be in, in Beijing again. <laughs> so we'll get to see what's really happening on the ground in, in Asia. Again, uh, thank you very much for being uh, 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 and watching our show this evening. And uh, good night. <laughs>